So I, I've given the crowd a little idea about what you do, Steve, uh, kind of your history, but I'd love to hear in your own words. Just tell us about your career path and what you're doing right now. Okay. Um, we'll probably cover some of the other... Th you guys don't need this, do you? Okay. I think it is. I, 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 uh, oh. Test, test. I, I, I can try to be loud if you'd like. I mean, everybody's pretty close here. It's not like a normal venue, but um, you know, it's big. But uh, I kind of have done a lot of things, and I didn't really start out planning to do the acting. I, before that, I was a model, and I didn't plan to do the modeling. So I kind of had this track that I was on that was okay, and it was nice. And the best acting I ever did was pretending that I was an actor, because I really didn't feel like one. I, I, there was so much angst in me about the whole thing that I was really thrilled when we finally had businesses that uh, my wife had a gift store. That's my wife, Kathy, back there. You'll meet later, maybe. But um, you know, we had a gift business that actually enabled me to leave acting. And I tried a couple other things as well, but that one finally clicked. And I was able to actually pursue creating, which still took 10 years. Um, so a lot of people always imagine people have these gifts, and that's part of what we'll talk about tonight. It's, it's that you, you never really, uh, you don't end where you start, and you don't start where you end. I mean, these things are normal uh, processes, whether they're creative processes or whether they're business processes. So uh, eventually then we came up here, and we established stores, and we established the painter's chair now in the last seven, eight years. And uh, in the meanwhile, I started writing, and I really, if, to be honest, if I could write and make a living at it, that's what I'd be doing. But you don't make money writing, um, evidently. <laughs> it isn't that I don't try. It's just that it's really hard, and the market's all changed. Even the art market's been really affected by uh, technology, something that we may or may not talk about, but it's very interesting what's happened. And, and also in the writing, it's been very self-publishing in a sense, which is a great opportunity, but it's like everybody can do it now. It used to be you'd get a publisher and it was like, yay, and things would happen. Uh, now today, everybody publishes, and so everybody's in the marketplace, and for you to be seen is something that I probably need as much help as anybody, so I'm not here to offer you that kind of information. Um, I'm pretty much the dinosaur on the techno side, but I have other things that I think might be of value to you tonight, I hope. So. Great. Well, uh one thing that I really like is, and it may be a little nerdy, but a, a good success quote. You know, something that's inspirational when you need it and resonates with you when you don't, but you can just keep it in your back pocket. So I ask you, you know, what's a, a success quote that, you know, resonates with you? Something that you like? Well, now you introduce it that way, it sounds like a funny quote. <laughs> <laughs> but... But it's a quote I heard just recently, and I really like it, and it makes sense of a lot of what I'm going to say tonight, probably. And it was John Newton, the old slave trader who was converted, who had written Amazing Grace. And at the end of his life, he said, I'm not the man I ought to be. I'm not the man I want to be. I'm not the man I hope to be. But thank God I'm not the man I used to be. <laughs> and so uh, part of the theme of tonight for me uh, is to encourage you to consider that you're a future person, that, uh, that uh, your future will even visit you um, currently. And when you grow accustomed to that future, a new future will visit you. And so these things continue to happen in our lives, and they'll happen in your, in your business. Um, you know, other people call it different things, but I call it your future, um, coming to pay you a visit. Somebody who's older and smarter than you are now, um, you know, and, and we'll talk about that. Absolutely. So we all come from different places. Uh, we have different backgrounds, different childhoods, and we're always curious, you know, what, what was your childhood like? And what did you want to be when you grew up? Was it an artist, <laughs> an actor, or was it something completely different? Well, the first part, I, I grew up in a really encouraging home, unlike some people I know. Um, my parents encouraged me in many ways. I had a third grade teacher who called attention to the fact that I really liked art and was more capable than other kids maybe my age. And so she encouraged my parents, and my parents that Christmas got me cartooning books and art sets and stuff. And so I began the process of, of creating, and it was, it's been a great joy my whole life. Um, so that was a very important piece of, of that. And it's important, you know, that to encourage you 
to be the people that encourage other people. Our words do lots. They create or they destroy and they birth things even. Um, so it's, it's important and I know that my parents always encouraged me that way and so I never, I never was as afraid as some people maybe. I'm still afraid of a lot of things but I, I didn't have as many fears as a lot of other people because I had parents who kept saying, you know, you're great. <laughs> you, know, you can do this. And I thought, well, sure I can. Um, and so that was very helpful to me. And then you had a second part to that question. What was that? What did you want to be when you grew oh, up? I the still time. don't know what I want to be. I guess a rock star. Rock star? <laughs> yeah. It didn't happen, but, you know, and if it had, I'm sure I would have been destroyed. So, um, and so I was spared success of that. And so there's a, there's a whole concept of being spared success. I mean, everybody here uh, might be more motivated towards having success, but I, I would caution you to be careful what you ask for. And maybe we'll talk more about that. So did you end up uh, going to college? Uh, I what did. What did you yeah. get out of it? I mean, there's a, there's <coughs> well, I just, you know. The, the point of question being there's no. a lot of, I wouldn't say controversy, but, you know, college is changing. Tuition's going mm -hmm. up, and the value proposition's different. So we always like to hear if you has been there. Well, I think they're different things. I mean, uh, the arts are totally wrong, in my opinion. The arts are completely wrong for the education system mm -hmm. um, because they don't encourage failure. And they encourage usually, unfortunately, there are teachers who not only teach, but they want to be worshipped. And so they create people who are little people of them. They're, they don't really encourage you to be something new or different or better than. I mean, heaven forbid that you'd be better than a teacher. Then you'd be destroyed by that teacher, usually. It's a very rare teacher who actually wants to see their student excel beyond their ability. Um, and, and I imagine it'd be very difficult. I mean, I, haven't, you know, I don't teach, so I don't run into that. But I can imagine that. But I think when it comes to technical things or doctor, you know, you're not going to want me to just show up and do a brain surgery. But, you know, because I just feel like it. <laughs> um, but then, in all honesty, I've worked honestly, as hard as a brain surgeon. I mean, I, I put the, the effort into art that I could have been a brain surgeon, is what I'm trying to say. So school has its place, but I find school to be really inefficient in anything creative. Mm -hmm. and, and, and even entrepreneurship, to me, is a very creative thing. And it flies in the face of what education has to offer, usually. Not always, but okay. pretty often. So uh, everybody's had one, your first job. <laughs> uh, mine was a dishwasher and you know, we asked because it's, mm -hmm. it's a long time ago for I think all of us, but yeah. at the same time it's right in that learning curve where you're really learning something no matter how menial the job is. So what was it and <coughs> Well I had a few, I mean I had a good one actually, it was a journeyman clerk. Um, some of you know me well enough to know I, I got married in high school. I was married my senior year of high school. I was married my junior year of high school. I was married through my senior year of high school. And my wife, Kath, and I have been married now 36, 37, and we have a couple of kids. Haley's one of them here. And, um, yeah, so some of you know Haley. I wasn't married to you, but, but I'm just saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's close. We're like 37 years. So, um, but, so I had a different life as a young person. I mean, I didn't have my normal <laughs> high school years uh, at all, really, in many ways. But um, so I ended up with a pretty, pretty good job. I was working at the grocery store, and I ended up being a journeyman clerk, which at that time was a pretty good you know, hourly wage, in a way, a very union-y job. And, um, but then I went off to school, and the worst jobs are the ones that made me think, I'm not going to do this. <laughs> and one was throwing 100 pound sacks of sugar. And I was like, no, I'm not doing that one. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was doing it just to make some money in college. But, right. um, and then the other one that I did for like two days, and it was, I worked, I went to Pocatello, Idaho State, for any of you that went there. And so Simplot's out there. I don't even know that. Well, Simplot has a, you know, so I, I got this like late shift, like, I don't know, I guess swing shift. I don't know what it was. <laughs> but anyway, you go and, you'd, and it would be like you'd get underneath a train and a conveyor belt would come by with acid peeled potatoes and you'd take these bad parts out of them and throw them as fast as you can back in. And meanwhile, you're like under a train and you got all this hard head, you know, got all the gear. Well, I did it one night and I, and I couldn't believe the people that I was meeting that were, they were career people. 
And I was like shocked. And then I started getting afraid because I thought, I wonder if, I wonder if it's contagious. <laughs> <laughs> so about the second night, I said, that's enough of that. So that was, I was glad to, I experienced that and I thought, you know, but I also knew that I didn't want to go up in the in, in a grocery thing. I didn't want to do any of these things. I knew I wouldn't be happy doing a normal job. Um, I just wouldn't be. And so I didn't know what it was, but I knew what it wasn't. And so when modeling showed up and I went and then I got successful at that, it was like, great. But it wasn't the love of my life. It was boring. And then uh, acting was boring too. It was, it, you know, it's not like you get to do great things. It's like usually you sit around all day and you wait to say the star went that way. You know, and then you wait for another five hours to say, and now he's over here. And that's kind of how that works, unless you're the star. And I rarely was a star. I mean, I, I had three shows that I starred with. One was with Barbara Stanwyck, and one was with Debbie Reynolds. And, and that was nice, but the most fun I actually had was doing Bold and Beautiful. Because soap operas, you do real scenes. You start a scene, you end a scene, you say something meaningful to each other. Whether it's cheesy or not, you're actually doing something. So it was kind of fun. I like that. Great. Well, um, we invited you here because yeah. you, you had an interesting career path with all these artistic expressions and passions. And mm -hmm. you know, we saw that at Innovation Collective as something that can translate into any business. You know, it doesn't have to be artistic, but to have passion in your business and to be creative in your business is something we thought we could learn something from, from Steve. And <laughs> So that's why you're here tonight. Um, but along with following your passions and creativity and blazing your own trail comes failures, mm -hmm. uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. um, and we wanted to hear more about that from you. So if you could tell me about some of your failures, when you've fallen flat on your face and been able <coughs> to get back up. And I know mm -hmm. you, you gave me your book mm -hmm. and you had two chapters in there, or you know, two mm -hmm. letters about failure. So. Mm -hmm. To hear more. Well, I think failure is important. I think, unfortunately, and most people try to keep from failing, and I'd, I'd rather see people quickly fail. Um, I mean, as, I mean, <laughs> you're nodding. The older people are nodding. They're going, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you can you can try to prop things up, and and some things need to fail. And so, um, the more that you would just go with that flow and decide if it's a learning curve, um, you know. The whole idea, one of the things I said in there was, uh, our failures make great fertilizer. You know, they grow things. They, it's not the end of anything. Um, and, they, and when they're parts of us, it's really difficult for me to take success and failure and separate them because they're so much parts of the same. Uh, um, you know, the successes that you see usually came after great failures. Uh, one of the famous quotes Thomas Edison made was, "I found ten thousand ways a light bulb doesn't work." Well, you know, he did find 10,000 ways it didn't work. Well, that's something. I mean, people misunderstand how important failure really is to the process. That's why I say education is such a poor, it's a good place to start and a terrible place to finish if you're an artist because it, it won't satisfy what you need to do. When I talk to young people, I tell them, look, when you're in class, do three times as much as they ask you and turn in the best piece. Um, the one that you're most proud of. You may or may not get a good grade. See, everybody's so focused on getting good grades, they're not, the focus isn't on learning. And in creative things, and I think in, in business especially too, uh, entrepreneur is exactly, to me, creative, period. I don't care whether you're painting, you know, or writing poetry, or whether you start a business. It's, it's a very creative process, and there aren't a lot of people that will encourage you the concept that it might take some failure before you have some success. And I, th I think that's huge. And uh, it's hard to say how important that is, but in my experience, it's huge. And I, and I feel like, you know, how many paintings? I had one, you know, I tell a story in one of my books. A woman comes in and says, I've, I've been taking painting lists. I said, great. She says, I, I've been working on the same painting for two months. I said, that's too bad. She says, what do you mean? I said, well, you should have 10 bad paintings by now. <laughs> she goes, well, how do you know it's bad? I said, it's being tortured. I mean, <laughs> nothing likes two months worth of you picking at it. And, 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 I said, and I said, in real honesty, I said, if I told you it took 300 paintings before you started even approach painting anything like you'd like, why are you wasting time on one or 50 or 299 if 300 is the mark where you begin to become uh, empowered, uh, become excellent. 
you know, masterwork comes after mastering. It doesn't come before. And everybody gets this wrong, and I think they get it wrong in businesses too. I mean, since I'm trying to, I'm trying to relate to you guys in a business sense as well, but it's, it's just hugely important. And, and I love being here with all these different ages of people hopefully helping one another. I mean, the idea that, that uh, uh, you know, that now I'm turned 62 this year, and so the big thing I see is, is I'm more and more confirmed to the fact that we participate in the successes and failures of each other. And we shouldn't have so many regrets. That's how I put it. We just shouldn't. We should really do our best to help one another because when we help somebody else, we help ourselves. It just is that way. Um, so um, part of what this is about is an excellent idea. And I think whether, you know, how it manifests, I don't know. But I think it's the right idea. And I think for that reason, I think it's a great idea. For the compliment. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so let's flip it a little bit and go from failure to success. Um, people talk about aha moments or moments when they realize they've made it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever had that in your life or if it's still something you pursue, but have you had one of those moments? Uh, and I made it moments. Uh, moment I have a lot of I thought I made it yeah, moments. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to hear about it. Well, yeah, most people have those. I mean, most people, if you had a I made it, it becomes I thought I made it. I mean, because really, in reality, it doesn't stay. So when I got Welcome Back Cotter, and I, you know, come on, I take Travolta's place, I thought I'm a member of a club now. I'm a star, I'm a teeny bopper icon for 14 minutes. I don't think I got all 15. <laughs> but, but you know what I mean? I was experiencing all those things. Like, well, this is going to be easy. Well, then it wasn't easy at all. And, you know, so you go through these different processes. I think, I think what's curious when you first ask the question was something that I brought up in one of the letters that I'd written. I, I have, I'm right, I've rough drafted a book called Letters to a Young Artist, The Painting of Your Life. And it's kind of about art, but it's kind of not. If you've ever read Letters to a Young Poet, which most of the literary people read, it was a great book that an older poet wrote to a younger poet who was asking for help, but he was writing these letters but back to him, but it wasn't really about writing poetry, it was about wise choices. It was a great book, very profound. So I was inspired that way. But we don't plan for success. So when success hits, it destroys just as many people as it helps. I mean, a lot of you are like, are totally focused on being successful, but have you ever really thought what that might mean, you know? Um, and then the deepest thanks, deeper apologies, I write, say money, power, and fame. They're like a trifecta. So if you get one, you might say, thank you, God. If you get two, you'll say, God who? And if you get three, you'll say, I'm God. <laughs> well, there are a lot of people that I've seen firsthand, whether it's um, in acting or, or you know, in life, um, people who've made tremendous amounts of money. I've seen people do terrible, crazy things. They just blow up. Um, and so the cost of success can be really big. And I don't think people really think about what that is, if they got what they wanted. That's, a, that's what I'm saying. I mean, be careful what you wish for, because if, if you get too much of any one thing, they're just almost detrimental. I don't know how many people are really capable of handling it. And, and almost everybody that I know, um, and I knew Pat Boone, for instance, and I know Pat kind of blew up, but he's okay now. <laughs> but I'm just saying, I mean, it, it, it took, you know, it took success and then for him to kind of fall out of whack and then get back and go, oh, okay, this is what's important. And I, and I, I you know, to caution the young people who are going forward thinking success is everything, meaning I make more money, I, I have more position, I have more power, um, whatever those things are for you, you have to really calculate what that means. I mean, it's a lot more than money. And, and if, if money's all you're looking for, even the most unclever people get wealthy. So, you know, that's not the biggest trick. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, like we talked about, you've, you've done a lot of different things, mm -hmm. and you, you kind of preluded to it a little bit, but I'm interested in the pivots you've made, um, the whys, and which were the biggest challenges to you, from actor to artist, or, you know, can you speak on that a little bit, please? Well, and we were talking about failure or, or whatever else. You know, acting was a really <clears throat> awful experience for me. 
in some ways, but it also, uh, our experiences are so important because they actually help make us things. They make us who we are. And so for me, uh, if, you, if you had 10% success on your interviews, you were killing it. You were making it. And that was great. Well, you know, I was, I was kind of doing that. But I was rejected 90% of the time. And so I got used to that kind of, you know, it didn't bother me that, I mean, it did bother me, but it didn't bother me. I kind of expected it. So then when I went into art, it's, I never expect everybody to like my art. It's, it's my art. And there are people who like it and there are people that don't. So as you go through these pivots that you're talking about, each one of them has its own draw and its own reason. You know, for me, to be honest, the writing has come about partly because I think art moves people. And yeah, pictures can paint a thousand words, but a thought can create a million words, a million thoughts. So to me, writing is so powerful that it isn't that I don't love art and creating and I'll still do it. It's just that I think writing and thought is so profound that it has so much more power, I guess is the word, weight, uh, to change people, to change things, to encourage them, to help them, to, um, you know, some of the things that we're talking about here. I mean, to me, those things, to be able to share those things and be articulate and to actually have them be understood is like a really neat, neat feeling. When somebody gets you, you know, and they hear you and they go, oh, that made sense. Or, you know, they look at your art and they go, oh, that was beautiful. Um, whatever it is that you do, they're always self-gratifying, you know, to, to have people get you. And so the pivots have taken me down that road, and that's why the writing to me is so big now, to be honest. I, I feel like time's running out, too. So it's like, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'll keep painting because I like to paint, but, I'm, but I feel a real importance to try to articulate things. I have three books now that I'm working on. And I'm a little compulsive and obsessive about it, and I never was that compulsive and obsessive about my art. That, that leads into a great segue to my next question. Um, talking about work-life balance. Mm -hmm. um, we all you know, work different schedules, different offices, yeah. different lives. Um, an mm -hmm. artist is different than an accountant, but mm -hmm. it sounds like you're a man that gets into his work. Um, how do you manage work-life balance, and what's one trick you have that you can share? Uh, there are a couple of them, actually, but um, I think the biggest one is probably solitude. Um, you know, it's, it's funny how you can put a lot of effort into something and not have anything happen, and then other times you'll just kind of fall into rhythm with, you know, some people call it karma or God or blessings and, or whatever, you know, but, but it's like all of a sudden you're in step with things. And a lot of times people are pushing things instead of just letting them roll. You know, and there's a pace to some things. And so when you, we live our lives, um, solitude to me is, a, is the one place where I can kind of, um, one thing I was writing about in one of the letters was, solitude is a place where things get birthed. And they're unsayable things a lot of the times. But even the best creations start without words. Even, even the ones that, make, that, are, that use words. <laughs> they start in silence. And so... Um, you have to start back to there. In the morning, I'll get up and I'll go in the sauna and I'll read and write and whatever and, and I'll pray or whatever. And, and so, but I, I have an hour or so in a sauna, a dry sauna, and uh, I sweat. But I mean, it's, it's, not a, it's not a steam sauna, so I can write and I can read and, you know, I can work through that. But, it, but, it's a, uh, but I find that to be very important. It's important for me as a person and as a husband and as a, as a friend or anybody, as a father. I mean, you know, if I don't have my own attention, see, I, I find our culture, and you guys might be more uh, wrapped up in it than I, I really am a dinosaur. I mean, I've only this last, since I started writing the book, I had to, I had to use email, so I started using it. So, um, but other than that, I mean, I had a typewriter until not too long ago. <laughs> and then I realized, well, that's really stupid. But, um, you know, I finally got over that. Uh, so I'm not your guy for the techno thing, but I really am alarmed at what's going on in our culture when people think, they're connected when I think they're just disjointed. You know, this, this interconnectivity and all this stuff, it's like, it's just nonsense. Now, it's true that it might be good for business and bucks. I mean, I don't do that enough, and I'm saying, I'm not your guy. If you want help that way, don't listen to me. But, but I'm trying to talk to you about your hearts more than I am about your business, and I'm trying to talk to you more about, about um, holding on to yourself instead of allowing yourself to be torn apart in this kind of melee of information age. Um, where everything is, is just a full tilt, um, it's, 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 it's not really very healthy. And, and so when I go to create, I find that I create in bursts. 
to be honest. Like today, I painted really hard for about three hours. But prior to that, I did 100 other things that had to be done business-wise. Like I've threatened to retire so that I could paint. <laughs> I'm a professional artist, you know. Um, doing the job of being an artist is a, is a profession. It's like any other job you guys might pursue. It's somebody has to take care of some of the things, you know, whether it's just calling somebody or, you know, there's a problem or there's a damage something. It's like, well, who's going to take care of that if, you know, I mean, I have help, and, but it still ends up a lot of things come through my, <laughs> through my plate. And um, so it's, it's one of those things. Um, lost my train of thought, actually. In your defense, you've been uh, very responsive from your iPhone on your emails today. So it's <laughs> I was doing a lot of other, oh, I was talking about bursts. And that's why it's important. See, I can get a lot done. There are days that I try to get things done, and it becomes a lot of work. And then I, f and then if, so if I don't take care of some solitude time, if I don't take care of some kind of structure, one of the things I, I have is I say I'm going to Scotland. It's a code, <laughs> it's a code word. And uh, when I'm, when I'm travel or anywhere, when we've been to places like Scotland, it's like nobody gets a hold of me. I'm gone. I, I mean, I might check in and you may get a hold of me in a day or something, but I'm not available. And so I decided I had to have times for creating that were available only to create. So in the morning, if I was feeling really needy, I like, sometimes I just, I need extra time uh, pushed aside because I'm, I'm fragile. And, I, and I, need, I need to step into the work um, gently. And so I, I say, I'm going to Scotland. That means I'm not going to take calls. I'm just gone. Don't even talk to me. Just leave, you know, leave me alone. And I'm going to go out to my studio. And I'm going to go to work. And um, so I, I, that's one thing I use to keep some sanity. Great. So this is my uh, hypothetical question to you. Um, okay. If you could go back in time and start it all over again, you just graduated high school, just graduated college, you know everything you know right now, mm -hmm. what would you do? Rockstar. Rockstar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Rockstar. Yeah. Right the rock. Easy enough. I don't know. I, I have lived... You know, as many times as you don't do the things you think you would have done, a lot of things you have done are things you would have done. And for me, it's, um, I, I've lived a pretty interesting life, so it's, I, I don't know how many different things I would have done that differently, but um, certainly some. But uh, generally, I've kind of pursued my heart um, about things, and I've gotten away with it, which is unusual. Um, not everybody gets to do what their heart desires and get away with it, or have somebody give you money for it, I'll put it that way. I mean, so I mean, I, it's, it's nice to have that as a job, and it's unusual, and I'm grateful. And, uh, but I, I don't know what else I would have done. Uh, I think I would have taken a lot more risks than I did, for sure. Uh, I, I'm a fairly risk-taking kind of guy, but I would have taken more, for sure. Yeah. Tried other things, new things. Great. Yeah. So, the best advice you've ever received. You like that one? No, I, she's bringing me water. <laughs> More water. Thanks, Whitney. Oh, thank you. So, the best advice you've ever received, and you know, why? Why does it resonate with you? Well, you know, there's an overarching th uh, way that I think. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I have a Christian faith, and I believe in a creator, and I was created to be creative. I think men and women were created in his image to be creative. So all those things are really important to me. So most of the things that I find are really deeply important to me are really more biblical in nature. But um, I always laugh at in one in the deepest things I write about King Solomon and everybody in you know, Sunday school always talks about being the wisest guy. He, ha he was the biggest fool, too. I mean, he was both. They don't tell you that. I don't know why. But um, <laughs> have you ever thought about it? It's true. No, think about it. I mean, every, every, every you know, man here you know, knows you should only have one wife, right? And every woman knows that that is better, too. So, so, so uh, I'm just saying, well, King Solomon, if you don't know the story, King Solomon asked for wisdom. He got to be the wisest guy in the world, and he was. He knew a lot of stuff. He ran the place. He, was, he had money, power, and fame, the trifecta. And he lost his mind, I guess, because he ended up with like hundreds of concubines and wives. And, you know. So anyway, he writes Ecclesiastes, which is basically after this whole thing has gone around. So he's the wisest guy in the world, and he's completely like an idiot. 
And, and so now, but this is, what's, this is what I think is profound. If I ask for wisdom, when would I get it? Would I get it with the money, power, and fame? Or would I get it in the knowledge of my own failure, my own weakness? I think he did get the wisdom, but I think it came full circle. And a lot of us don't consider that. But anyway, at the end of it, he said it was all wind, and it was all vanity, and it was all a waste of time in a way, all the things he pursued. But in the end, he says, basically, he says, seize life, enjoy life, eat the bread, drink the wine, love your wife. You know, he says, and whatever your heart's desire, pursue it, knowing that you'll have to answer for every bit of it to God. <laughs> but he says, pursue it. It's not, we're not to be timid. So um, for me, that's kind of how I look at that. I'm encouraged by that. Um, I, we're not supposed to be timid. We're supposed to be risk takers. We're supposed to, uh, you know, feel free to to really live full lives and expression. And and so I, I just feel like it was. I, I always found that to be very encouraging. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so on that path, the most innovative or inspirational person you've met. Oh, did I have to meet them? Uh, you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> it's your show. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, <coughs> I don't think of innovation that way, I guess. I'm, well, you know, I was talking about it with my wife, and, and I think, you know, there are a couple. I mean, Thomas Edison, obviously, just, just for tenacity. But, but somebody like Michelangelo, there's a great quote Michelangelo said. He said, you wouldn't think this mastery is so great if you knew what it cost me. <laughs> so, you know, we, we, I, we just imagine these people have these gifts, and they're just like, you know, we, we, I think Mozart, that was true, but Mozart's like, <laughs> he's not even human probably. I mean, you know, where'd he come from? Uh, the rest of us have to figure this out. The rest of us have to learn, and we start here and we go there. And, and in many ways, we're the kindergartner moving through uh, education system. You start and you go, but Michelangelo, um, amazing guy. I like anybody who... Um, See, to me, innovation involves uh, creating, um, creating, period. But uh, in the first book I wrote, Created Creator, I said, uh, I often wonder what beauty doesn't exist because we didn't create it. I mean, you can wake up every single morning and make something new. It never existed before. And nobody hardly bothers. But, <laughs> but can you imagine how big that really is? I mean, if, if you took hold of that yourself and said, today I can, I can, I can create something that never existed today, whether it's a, a thought or a poem or a painting. It could be a kindness. And the other thing I said in that, if you've ever loved or forgiven, you've created in the highest forms of creativity. I mean, what makes you think every area of our life isn't creative? I mean, it's hugely creative. You know, it's not just being an artist. It's not just being a business person. It's just in relationships. I mean, this is, this is fascinating how, how we can create, you know, out of those things, and I, so I'm always blown away by people who, who do that, you know. One of them was, I have a funny story of Captain Purdell. He, he was innovative. He was my captain at the Salvation Army okay. down in California, and he was an Englishman, and he was crazy, but he was innovative. <laughs> he would dress up with a full clown outfit like Bozo and stand in front of a triple X porn, and he'd fly <laughs> his banner that said, Satan is the father of all lies, and I just looked at him, I go, what? What are you doing? <laughs> and, but he was just this, he had a sense of humor, and he, and, he, and, he, and he possessed a patience and a grace to help the homeless who are, I don't know how many of you deal with homeless, but they're not always that great a group of people. They're not thankful usually, and they're not grateful, and they're, they're, they're tough. They're, they're tough to deal with. And he dealt with them graciously. I was like, wow. So besides, obviously, your own books, um, could you make a recommendation for a book you think that everyone here should read and get some? <sighs> the correct answer for the Christian is the Bible. Um, but there are a lot of writers and writers that I love too. Um, but the Bible is important to me. But I love um, some of the other writers that are Christian as well, like Oswald Chambers, Henry Nolan, um, the nice Catholic guy. He's dead. Uh, C.S. Lewis is great. One of, the, one of the books that nobody reads of C.S. Lewis, if you ever read any of his works, is a book that nobody reads called The Great Divorce. And that's a great book, a tiny little thing, a fictional story about the divorce of heaven and hell and, and a story about a bus that goes to heaven 
every day. <laughs> but nobody gets on it. <laughs> they don't want to go to heaven. So, I mean, but there are all the reasons. It's really fascinating. And he, and he explains these huge, giant, I mean, it's like this is what he and Tolkien and those guys would get together to talk about. They, they have these huge overarching stories that could only be explained in some simple story. Because if you actually tried to explain it in some doctrinally or theologically way, it would be stupid. You know, sometimes words can only tell lies. I mean, sometimes you just need to be silent. <laughs> and just, you know, some, you know, some things are better unsaid. And just leave them at that. Um, but I think um, all those writers are great. And Frederick Buechner is one of my favorites. And he just makes you cry when you're not expecting it. It's like, he just says weird stuff if you know him. You'll be just rambling along, and then all of a sudden he'll just say something that just stirs your heart and leaves you crumpled. <laughs> it's like, how do you do that? What happened? Um, but that's the kind of writing that I like. I mean, you know, I, I would rather have something that kind of jars me or breaks me or whatever. Oh, Art and Fear is a wonderful book. Thank you, Haley. A actually, for creative and I think for business sense, that's a wonderful book, uh, Art and Fear. It was written by a couple of guys years ago, and it was kind of an underground book. Not underground, but it wasn't known very well. And they, they're over in Portland or someplace, and two educators. And they write about all the pitfalls of education really well, <laughs> uh, much better than I got into it, and, uh, and, and how difficult creating is. Um, people misunderstand how difficult it is to actually create. And I think, you know, in, in thinking of businesses and stuff like that, there's a lot of um, uncertainties. It's difficult to um, have the courage to take a risk um, when it's not a sure deal. Um, you know, and I think, you know, we've done a few different things, my wife and I, when we made pivots before. Mm -hmm. We went to the Art Expo in New York back in the 80s. And that was a big pivot for me art-wise. And it was very expensive and didn't really have the money to spend, but it was like 10 grand. And we figured, you know, for the booth and stuff, and we thought, oh. So but we'll go out there for a week and spend all this money and go to New York and see a play or two. And we may lose $10,000, but instead we've made all these contacts and made a lot of money. And the first night we made back double what we spent. So we were having a blast. We had a party. I mean, we just had a good time. And then we actually started the gift stores that got me out of acting on, uh, with $5,000 on credit cards. So, uh, so that's our business kind of keen. And then the other, then when we had a successful business finally, and we had a situation that happened, and we actually did like 100,000 in art sales in a day, or 120 or something like that. They wouldn't loan us the money. I mean, I mean, they, they, the, the art, it was stupid, but the art person was saying, no, you have to buy this stuff. We said, look, we're going to sell it, and you know, we'll give it back what we don't, or we'll pay for what, you know, whatever. But they said, no, you have to buy it. <laughs> it's like, what? And we knew, we'd already pre-sold, and we knew we were hoping for another 50000 in sales, but so that, you know, so we put our cars up, you know. I mean, so we, you know, business-wise, that's an interesting thing. See, I, we are kind of risk-takers in that respect, I guess. Um, and, and, I, and, and I think, um, you know, I think, I think we've instilled that a little bit in our kids even, I think, that, you know, they'd rather, if, I work really hard. Um, one of the bad things that I've noticed about entrepreneurs and about people who work for themselves is sometimes you're the worst boss in the world. You work too hard. You work yourself too hard. You expect too much of yourself. And um, so there's a danger in that. And I saw us do that with gift stores in the beginning. And, and I have to be careful of that with my art because there's, no, there's always a painting unpainted. <laughs> I mean, I, have, I, I can go through my studio right now and I can find a thousand pictures I took that I was going to paint that I haven't. You know, and then I'll be gone you know, on a trip and I'll come back with another 500. So. <laughs> um, there's always more to do. Finding that balance is really a very tricky p part of our lives. And, and so for the entrepreneur, you should be very, very um, aware that, that you need to be a better boss. Yeah. <laughs> well, entrepreneurs, be good to yourselves. Um, <laughs> we want to give you some time for Q&A. So yep. we're going to call it there. But thank you, Steve, for coming out and sharing with us tonight. Appreciate yeah. it. Sure. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, okay. With a picture of mine, it's easiest for you to, to form and put on canvas. It's usually, it's usually someplace I want to go. Uh, I'll paint peaceful things usually, or I'm just not very avant-garde in that regard. Um, I usually like, if I have my choice, then there are usually places I want to go. I'd rather, I'd rather go paint a mountain scene, for instance, but I don't make money doing mountain scenes. I make money a lot of times doing pianos and <coughs> interior rooms. And so I, you end up painting for yourself um, on the sly, you know. You, <laughs> well, my most inspirational is to go up on you know, Coeur d'Alene River up Cataldo Creek area and just paint. Um, that's a blast. I mean, it's really fun. And especially if you go with some other friends, you know, and you spend some time painting. That's, to me, those are the most honest paintings because I paint, I paint my impression of what I see that's before me. I change things. I compose. I design. But, and, and I think a lot of artists don't, which I don't get. But... <laughs> Um, but I design and compose anything I see. If I don't like a tree where it is, he's gone. If I want to add a tree, he's there. Um, you know, so I paint like that. I don't care. I, and I had one friend that I went painting with, for instance, and we were painting, and it, and it was overcast, and, and, and it was boring, and the light was really boring, and so I, I painted a, a, a faint sun coming through and you know, hitting the water, and it was kind of getting nice. It was really pretty. And my friend, <laughs> my friend who came over, and he had no idea. He says, and, he, and he, I saw him look in the sky. And <laughs> he looked at my painting, and he looked back to the sky, and I said, no, it's, it never got sunny. I said, it, it never came out. Because he was like, did I miss this? When did you see this? And I said, you know, I said, I paint what I want. You know, and, and, I, and so I have a freedom that a lot of artists don't seem to have. It's kind of funny that children and masters have freedom that students and the general don't. Like they're, they're required to paint certain ways, certain things, certain colors. It's like, you know, no, I'm, I'm not. Can I follow up with another yeah. I'm curious yeah. about that is, you said that one of your big roles in your acting mm -hmm. dealt with uh, Welcome Back Carter, uh -huh. and went Travolta left. Yeah. Is there a correlation about sister here or no, any kind of just a coincidence. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's the question. But uh, you and know, I had a conversation a few years back about uh, your early acting career and a conversation you'd had with Dean Jones. Oh yeah. About uh, compromising yeah. your sense of morality. Yeah. Talk about that. Well I had I had I had the good fortune. I went to a church. Um, actually I, I I went back to church as a result of meeting Pat Boone at a I was a celebrity at the time, and, and I was at a celebrity event, and we were playing tennis and golf and all that stuff back east, and, and uh, Beth of Bible Village in Chattanooga, Tennessee. But then Dean Jones was a guest star on the show that I started with Debbie Reynolds. It was called Aloha Paradise. Dean Jones was on the show, and he was in, we were shooting in Hawaii, and they, they had a, a Hawaiian god for him to pray to in a scene, and he says, I'll pray to God, but he says, I can't pray to that god. <laughs> and they said, well, that's the way it's written, and they need to do it. And he says, I'm not doing it. And I went, wow. That's different. <laughs> and then, uh, so we got back to LA and I'm on the Universal lot and he comes to my dressing room and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and he came to my dressing room and we, and we prayed, you know, in my dressing room. I went, wow, that's different. <laughs> and then he says, let's go pray around the, the sound stage. And I'm going, okay. You know, and I'm thinking, this is gonna look stupid. This is crazy. <laughs> And uh, so we walked around and we prayed around the whole thing. Nobody really noticed what we were doing, but we we're walking around. He's praying the whole thing, you know. And I'm going, wow, this is different. And um, but but Dean was one of those guys that really showed me some things in the art world, in the acting world that um, I understood in a different way finally. And and um, and, and I've had a lot of good mentors, really. Um, it's I, I mean that's why it's so important for us to share with each other. It's um, it, there's a lot that we can learn from each other. It's like, I always look at us like we have all these gifts that we never exchange. It's like we come together and we have, um, it's like we have presents and we set them under our chairs and we all visit and everything and then we all get up and take our present. Well, if you looked at the present, it probably ends up having somebody's name. It might be the guy sitting next to you or the woman over here or whatever, but we don't get up and actually go here. And they don't go here. And we should always be leaving with a new gift. That's kind of the way I see it. And so, um, 
you know, the, the way I put it in my book, I said, the, these letters will be our opportunity to share our gifts and get new ones in return. And that's what every meeting, especially a meeting like this, I think, um, has a potential to do. It has the possibility that you could actually uh, gift one another something. And, and, and young people misunderstand that they understand things that older people don't. So you have gifts for older people. Just as an older person, you go, oh, I need a mentor. Well, yeah, well, a mentor might need some encouragement <laughs> from a younger person who is just totally out there and ready to face the world with fresh courage. And you go, I need some courage. You know, I'm a little wore out. Um, I've had a, too many failures in a row. Um, these things are kind of important. And I think that's something that you, know, you should consider here, everywhere, though, whenever you go any place. Um, the idea that you have something for somebody else and they have something for you. It's a great adventure that way, I think, if you start to think that way you know, as a possibility. Yeah? I like that you mentioned that solitude. Mm -hmm. A father and a husband and a yeah. and work and everything. There's yeah. always somebody that wants something from the right? Yeah. And so how do you make that decision to commit to your own needs when you know that you're giving, but yeah. you look better at the people around you? Wouldn't you say, I don't have anything to give you right now. I need to do my yeah. Daddy time. Well, I, you know, I think it's. A, I think when I was younger, um, I was a little careful about being a workaholic. I think I tried to stay home more than. In fact, when I first, when I, when I was an actor and I thought I was going to be a star, I was home with my kids really for like three years when they were little, because um, they didn't work. Most of the time, I was unemployed. <laughs> I mean, I was an actor and I was successful. This is what you have to remember. I was successful. I, most of the time, I'm unemployed. Um, so. I'm home playing tennis, waiting to be a star, and, but my kids are there. So they grew up thinking daddies stay at home. I kind of, didn't you? Kind of? A little bit. I mean, you were younger than Steph, too, but, but you know, for those first few years, and then you know, we started working, and then we started trying to do gift stores, and I started trying to do a wood business. It was totally illegal in California to have this wood business in my garage. <laughs> and then I, had a, and I took a space, totally illegal there, too. If I'd started a fire and burned down the whole thing, I would have been up a creek. So the solitude piece, what, what I find is that for me to get the time that I need to do some things, I just get up earlier and earlier. Um, you know, my wife likes to stay up a little later than I do, but you know, I f if, if I really want to get something done, I'd get up at four. You know, I'm a morning person, though. I'm not an evening person. So for me, I would get up, you know, um, I mean, there have been times I've even gotten up at three. Because, see, I can get between anything before 9 o'clock, I, I, I mean, I can, four hours, I can get what most people take 12 hours. I paint hard and fast. I don't mess around. It doesn't mean they always work, but, uh, you know, like I said, bursts. It's like I, I kind of gear up to do something, and then I do it, you know. And the writing's the only thing that just totally consumes me, though. Like, I can, I, she can leave me in the morning. I, I could be in my robe, and I could be there all day long and not eaten. I mean, people used to talk about painting and creating like that. And I always thought, no, nah, it doesn't happen to me, because I stand when I paint, and I get tired. <laughs> I have to sit down or take a nap or eat something. Um, so I have a regular repetitious two-hour cycle when I paint. But when I write, I get lost, totally lost. Just, I don't even know where I go. And five hours can pass. That's just weird. I've never felt that that kind of compulsion before in all the other creative endeavors I've done. The writing, though, takes me away. Um, and that's one reason I so enjoy it. It's, um, it's, it's fascinating. And it's always a challenge. See, that's what people don't understand even about painting. It's like, I still haven't mastered painting. I mean, that's one reason it's still fun, though. I mean, what's going to be fun if you master it, really? I mean, I mean, there's no variation. There's no, you don't know. You know, I mean, if you know everything, that's like, ah, there's nothing exciting or new today. No. I know you had. Going back to your stores, do you feel like, um, because you had several in your life, do you feel like they've kind of fallen into your lap, or did you have to go seek out your mentors? You know, I think it was both ways in different situations. I think, um, I know that, um, well, I'm, I, I'm trying to take it more serious myself to be a mentor now that I'm older. I don't know when that happened. 
But um, you know, I've had younger guys asking me to mentor them in different facets, different you know, whether it's art or other things. But um, you know, it seems to me that the mentors are kind of. Um, I think. I think you have to ask. I, I, I mean, I don't know how many mentors go around thinking they're mentors, for instance. Um, you know, I mean, I think that when a mentor becomes a mentor, it's because somebody sees them as a mentor, not because they see themselves as a mentor. Um, so I think it's probably the other way around. Um, I mean, I would offer myself as a mentor, but, you know, that seems weird. <laughs> you know, but to have somebody ask me to help, it's like, oh, yeah, I can do that. So I think that's kind of more the, the role. I mean, how it plays out. Yeah. Okay. We have time for one more question. <coughs> so at the early stage that you started your business, mm -hmm. what would be you know, a risk that you took that had a huge payout? Mm -hmm. And then what would be a risk that didn't work out that you could take back? Hmm. Well, in business, um, we had three stores at one time. You may or may not know them, the Hidden Cottage. They were older uh, in time. We, they were in the corner where the Marketplace Gifts is now, and it was there from the inception of that mall. Then we went and opened one in Northtown, and then we opened one in downtown. And um, there's a place where things get crazy um, as you multiply, <laughs> um, and sometimes it isn't profitable. It's just crazy. <laughs> so um, I think we, we overextended ourselves. I felt like I was bouncing around like a ping pong ball. And, um, and then, of course, you're cutting into your own market. So at some point, is, there's a, not a great return for that. So you start diminishing your own profit, um, if, you know, depending on what you're doing. But in that case, we did, I think, um, because we were offering the same products and we were, you know, not far from each other in many ways. Um, so finally, we closed that one. Then we just had North Town. And, um, you know, but I, it, I, I think you have to just take a shot, you know? I mean, we bought Painter's Chair. We found out it was available. Um, you have to move. Um, we knew that's a, that was a prime location. It wouldn't be as for sale in our lifetime again, probably. So when we found out what it was and the price, I said, and we were even out of town, actually. We were, I was doing an art show in Napa or something. And we find out about it, I said, well, I want it. So we called bankers and stuff and locked it up. But basically, I said, I'll, I'll, I'll pay. I'm not going to dicker with them. I'll pay that price. And I'll take it as is. You know, I mean, hopefully, there wasn't a lot of asbestos or anything. I mean, I, I, I don't think that would be the wisest thing to do, except that we kind of knew the building, and people said there's nothing really too much to worry about. It's just an old crappy building, though. You're going to have to put in a couple hundred thousand. But I mean, when you know you want to do something, and we felt like we'd just keep it the whole time we were here because we didn't want to live here. Um, so you just have to, you have to go for it. <laughs> I mean, y you don't know it's going to work. I mean, most of the things in life are like that, though. And if you won't try and take the risk, and sometimes get the success, sometimes get the failure. What's the point of it? I mean, there was a, there was a group of elderly people that were interviewed, um, and they said, well, they were really old people, too. I mean, they'd lived 90s and whatever. They said, so what are the, all these people, they said, what are the three things that you really regret about your life? And they said, well, I, I really would hope for more transcendence, that, you know, it would matter that I was here. Uh, another one was they, they wish that they had... Uh, uh, Considered more, uh, contemplated, solitude, you know, get in touch with yourself. And the other one was that overall was above all the others, and the primary one was they said, I wish I would have risked more. Like, what was I afraid of? There are a lot of things that when we play it too safe, we, we really miss out. I mean, that's, I'm always fascinated with people, you know, the people come and they say, well, I can't even draw a stick figure. And I just look at them, I go, when's the last time you practiced a stick figure? I mean, really. I mean, none of us gets good at this anything in our lives without practice. And so it's, it's a, you know, this is just, it's a learning curve. This idea of future, huge concept. You're not who you are. You're somebody, <laughs> you are in the future in a sense. You're moving that way. So I think that's an important thing to remember. Um, and to take the risk, I mean, 